Hey, it's David Levin, and welcome to our Ask Them Yourself Celebrity Zoom Party, where you ask the questions face-to-face. -face. And today, we're really happy to welcome actor Fred Melamed. You know him from shows like Barry, American Crime Story, WandaVision, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Crazy Ones, and from movies like A Serious Man, In a World, Anna and Her Sisters, and many more. Before we get started, I want to remind you that you can get invitations to be on future Celebrity Zooms with a chance to talk face-to-face -face with the stars by becoming a Patreon member of Pop Goes to Culture TV. And if you're not ready to pull the trigger on membership, you can always watch future episodes by subscribing to our channel. And if you ring that bell, we'll let you know every single time we upload a new video. And now, here is actor Fred Melamed. Good evening, and welcome to our Zoom with Fred Melamed, everybody. I see some familiar faces, people who have been on our Zooms before. I think I've been to, to bed with everybody in the room. Is that not correct? Am I confused about that? Well, maybe not Kurt's daughter. <laughs> I wasn't counting her, of course. Thank you. Um, see, already we're in trouble. Already we are in trouble. Fred has been, is, is, has been a friend of mine for a number of years. Um, and a terrific actor, and uh, and I, if, if I started listing everything he's been in, it would be time to wrap up the call. Um, so I'm just going to have to assume that you have his IMDb in front of you. Um, just a reminder that Robert Wool will be uh, doing a Zoom with us on Thursday. Fred, of course, you're invited to that as well. Um, before we start, uh, does anybody want to... Uh, Ask any questions, uh, you know, just to get the get the ball rolling. If you do, raise your hand. No, I'm not seeing people's names in the uh, in the uh, thing like I should be. You should be. I'm seeing them. Yeah, I'm not. I wonder why. Maybe it's the way they're stacked. Oh, there we go. They there just you came go. Off. They just came up. Thank you. Okay, so who have we got here? Does somebody want to raise their hand? Does anybody have a question to begin with for, for hey, we Fred? Keep, up. keep the names up. Why did they go away? I you don't just know. Just scroll still... over them a little bit. You got to just move your mouse over it, and it comes ah, up. Ah, thank you. <sighs> Orin Levy, say hi, hi Fred. To Fred. Hi, Orin. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Hey, I have always wondered how did you get involved with Woody Allen movies. Um, I'll tell you what happened. When I went to drama school, uh, this was back in the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, I got out of drama school in nineteen eighty one. So they had a kind of a collective audition for all the big drama schools, Yale Drama School, where I went, Juilliard, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, uh, ACT out in San Francisco, all the kind of uh, big name drama schools had a centralized audition in New York, held, it, held uh, in the city. And it, it was full of agents and producers and others, guys from Saturday Night Live, people who wanted to see all the, everybody there was you know young, young talent. So um, I had kind of a spotty career at Yale, but I did, but I did very well at these last auditions. Um, and uh, a casting director was there to observe all these auditions. I, I took a kind of a risk in these auditions in that I, I, ha, I, I was thinking if I was sitting there for hours watching hundreds of young earnest actors audition, what would I want to see? So I thought something really, you know, ridiculous and funny, but funny in the extreme kind of Monty Python sense. So a friend of mine called Keith Redeen, a playwright, wrote a play that I had done, really silly and ridiculous, but with a nice juicy part for me in it. So me and David Allen Greer and seven or eight other people did this, this scene. And uh, my, what I was hoping would happen happened, which was that the people had been there for hours already and by the time we came on with our idiotic um, thing, they were really ready for something like that. And it, was, and it went over very, very well. So at the end of that, they, everybody who was interested in meeting you, every agent or producer or director, would, would put your name up on their list. So I was extremely lucky and got my name on a lot of those lists. And one of the lists that I got on was a woman called Juliette Taylor, oh. very famous casting director, um, now retired, but was a, you know, discovered many, many, many famous actors, John Boyd, Tom Cruise, millions of actors. Anyway, so she had me, uh, my, my name down there. So I went to meet her and uh, 
I left after that to work at the Guthrie Theater, which is a theater in Minneapolis for a year. And when I came back to New York, I just got a call from her saying, uh, Woody would like to meet you. And I was a huge fan of Woody Allen, you know, really loved him and he was around, his work was around from the time I was a young guy. Um, so I went in uh, to meet him just very briefly and we talked for a minute or two and he said, okay, and that was it. And then I got a call the next day saying, um, Woody would like you to play a, a, uh, a doctor in this film, Hannah and Her Sisters. So there was no audition. He just chatted, just you know, said hi to me. That was essentially it. So I did the part in Hannah and Her Sisters and I didn't know him well enough or didn't know protocol well enough that I, that I avoided, I did not avoid trying to make him laugh. Trying to make him laugh is really uh, extremely difficult, but I was too dumb and too inexperienced to know this. So I, so I tried to be funny and he actually kind of liked it. I, <laughs> surprise. So he cast me in that as a doctor. And if you ever go see that movie, Hannah and Sisters, he thinks he has a, a, a brain tumor. And there's a series of three doctors who he, who he consults. And I'm the first doctor who scares the shit out of him. Um, shortly after that, I was in Amadeus on Broadway. And when I was in Amadeus, I had this horrible experience of unbelievable stage fright, awful crippling stage fright to the extent that I thought, oh, I made this horrible mistake. I, I don't wanna be an actor, I can't stand it. I went to Yale Drama School, everybody said to me, oh, it's very hard, I said, oh, I'll show you and all this. And I got this Broadway gig and I hated it, I couldn't stand it. And I was in this show for 16 months. So when I got out of, when the show finally ended, um, I thought, Jesus, what am I gonna do? And I started doing voiceovers. And some of you know me from that world. And I did nothing but voiceovers for almost 25 years, except occasionally certain casting directors who liked me, like Juliette Taylor, there was another guy, Howard Feuer, and a few, uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn Stallmaster, a bunch of casters just liked me for some reason. And they would call me up and they'd say, oh, you know, it's no audition. Woody has a psychiatrist. It's two days. You want to do it? Uh, and because I didn't have the nervousness that most actors do, because I was making quite a good living doing voiceovers and didn't really care that much about the other stuff that I got, I had the great liberty of, of not caring and being kind of relaxed about it. So I did kind of well in these things. And Woody, for some reason, liked me and uh, then just kept putting me in his movies. And uh, I did seven movies, more than any other actor besides Woody and Mia Farrow and Diane Keaton. <laughs> Uh, seven of his films. Interestingly, when I began to catch on as an actor, he kind of stopped calling. Um, but uh, years ago, um, I was in a lot of his films and, and he, uh, he took a shine to me for some odd reason. I think part of it was, I was in those days was much heavier than I am today. I was quite large. I was very fat and near to 400 pounds at some point. Some point. And I think that he actually kind of liked, you remember, Charlie Chaplin had that <laughs> enormous guy that used to scare him in, in a lot of movies. I think Woody, I think my overbearing presence uh, appealed to Woody. So he would just put me in, in various uh, imposing uh, roles. <laughs> in movies. Um, so that, that was how it started. And occasionally I would see him in New York. I'll tell you one other, one other quick Woody Allen story. Um, Woody Allen is a very, very unusual cat. He's just a, I, I've never met anybody like him. He's in absolutely the wrong profession because he doesn't like people. Um, he doesn't like being bothered by people or talking to people. He's not, he's not what they used to call a people person in the old days. He's brilliant in my opinion, but he doesn't like, he doesn't like people asking him questions, talking to him. And when you're a film director, that's essentially what your life is about nonstop. People run up to you all day long saying, uh, do you like this one or this one? Do you, should we have the back? Well, we can't get this actor. Can we get another act? It's all it is, is a series of problems to be solved, which require you talking to people, which he can't stand. Um, so I did a play with him on Broadway. It was actually three one acts, one of which was by him. Uh, one was by Ethan Cohen, one was by him, uh, and another one that, that I wasn't in, but I was in those two. 
And he, since he already knew me, he said, actually, Juliet Taylor said, would you mind helping him audition other actors? Just sit in the room and read with them. So I said, no, I'd be happy to. So when you do that, when you audition with uh, audition other actors, you're not there to, you know, to give your opinion. You're just there to read. Uh, so <laughs> I, I was reading with this one guy and inadvertently when the guy was finished, I, the, I felt the guy was very good. And I, out of my mouth blurted, that was great. Oh my God. I shouldn't have said anything, but I, it just came out, I just came out of my mouth. I said, that was great. And the guy was very gracious and he left the room and Woody walked over to me and he said, don't encourage them. <laughs> <laughs> thank oh you Fred God. that's an emblematic story of the way of the way Woody Allen is he's, he's just a, he's he's um he doesn't enjoy the he said to me during the during the rehearsals of that play he said you know I really like writing I enjoy writing and if it were up to me I would write for four hours every day I would take a walk in the park I would have he has the same dinner every day for a hundred years. He has a filet of sole with green beans and a salad. That's what he eats every day. I would have my filet of sole. I would watch basketball and I would go to sleep. And I would not direct any movies. I would just write them. But I don't trust anybody else to make my movies. So I'm in this position where I have to make them myself. But he, I think he, he, you know, he's a writer at heart who's been thrust into the position of a director, um, which he still... <laughs> you know, after all these years, uh, wears kind of grudgingly. It's odd. I never knew that. I never knew that he uh, he did not want to be a director because everybody else, they say, what I really want is to be a director. And he's like, what I really don't want to be is a director. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting about that. When you actually find out what being a director is, I think, I think it's very different than many people uh, imagine. Um, uh, you know, it's so, it's so much about problem solving. I'll give you another brief story about the, talking about directing. Um, I did a couple of films with the Coen brothers. And I was a big admirer. Never, of, never heard of them. <laughs> Go ahead. A uh, big admirer of their work. And I kind of wanted to learn what I could from them because I had a project I had written and I wanted to direct it myself and so on. I just want to see how they got these great, you know, results. Um, so uh, I, I, I observed what they were doing, but I was talking to Ethan Cohn and I said, you know, you have this film that I just, I think it's a wonderful film. It's called The Man Who Wasn't There, but it, it never got the attention that I thought it should get. I thought it was, I think it's one of your best films, but it happened to have come out right around 9-11, kind of obscured by 9-11 as, you know, understandably, but I just love it as a film. It's so beautifully constructed, the writing is great, the performances are great, and it's shot in black and white, it's beautiful looking. Anyway, I said, this, I just love that film. And he said to me, oh, you know, Billy, uh, Billy Bob Thornton still lead it. He said, Billy Bob's wig never fit right, and we had to give up uh, a location that we loved, and we couldn't make a deal with, you know. He, he recited to me every problem in the making of that movie. Um, oh, my friend who wanted to come says she can't find where to log in. Andy Shulman, who paid to, to. Oh, did we send? I'll I'll send her a. Uh, I'll send her a thing. All right, can can you can continue? Fred. I'll I'll send her a note. Anyway, one of the people who paid the full the full <laughs> the full rate. I know. She gave a hundred bucks. I thought I thought, wow, Jesus, she give me that hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, Ethan Cohen just recited to me every problem that they had encountered in the making of this movie. And then I realized that for them, when they're writing it, they're writer directors. So they sit in this little room that they have, this little, this little office that they have, and they kind of brainstorm back and forth and they act out the parts. They actually act out the parts as they're writing them. And they imagine everything. And that's kind of the most enjoyable part for them and then when they start directing they do like actors but it's a series of problems to be solved essentially uh, that's the way directing is i will, I, I know I'm, I'm yapping and yapping i'll tell you there's one more story i want to tell you about directing this is my favorite story about directing yeah go ahead this was told to me by um uh, 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 a director called james gray very interesting uh russian-american director um 
So when they were making The Godfather, if you remember The Godfather, the actor that Francis had hired uh, to play Luca Brazzi um, was an actor called Lenny Montana. Actually not an actor, he was a professional wrestler with very limited acting experience. But he looked great as you remember from the movie. Mm -hmm. He was very imposing looking. And because he had been a wrestler, he had a skill, which was he had the capacity to make his eyes bug out. He, could, he just had this, this ability. And if you remember in the movie, he's garroted. He, he pretends to be a turncoat and goes to the Tatalia family to talk to them. And he goes to a bar and they stick a knife through his hands and, and they garrot him with a, a wire and they choke him. And you could see his eyes kind of pop out. So Francis loved the fact that he had this ability and he certainly looked the part, but he was very uncomfortable with lines. So the very first day that they're shooting the movie was the day, was the first scene in the movie at the big wedding, the big wedding scene of, uh, of uh, Francis Coppola's daughter, Talia Shire's daughter, I mean Talia Shire. Mm -hmm. So in that scene, in that series of scenes, there's supposed to be a place where Luca Brazzi comes in and says, I want to thank you, Godfather, for the honor of inviting me into your home on the day of your daughter's wedding. And he's supposed to deliver this line. But Lenny Montana was extremely nervous and was the very first scene they were shooting. And it was very expensive. There were hundreds of extras and big first day. And Lenny Montana could not get this line right. He was totally nervous. He was sweating. And he kept saying, I, I want to thank you, Godfather, for the honor of inviting me to your daughter's wedding on the day of your daughter's wedding. He couldn't get the line right. They, they, <laughs> shot, they shot it 40 times. He could not get it right. And finally, Francis said, I got it. It's fine. And Robert Evans, the producer, said, what do you mean you got it? He never said it. And Francis said, no, no, it's fine. I have it. I have it. And Robert Evans said, he didn't say the line. What are you going to do? He didn't say the line. Francis said, I have an idea. Before the next setup, Francis made up a scene with Lenny Montana sitting at a table, practicing the line. And you see him sitting, practicing the line, going, I want to thank you, Godfather, for the honor of inviting me to your daughter's wedding. And you see children run by. Francis, on the fly, invented that scene, put it in the movie. And then when you see Lenny Montana blow the line in the actual take, it makes perfect sense. Genius. I tell this story because directing movies is all about wild horses. It always gets away from you. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of it. You know, there's so many people, there's so many variables. So it's a lot about riding all these wild horses and keeping them in a, not a paddock, but I don't know, in some kind of, some kind of, a, some kind of a organization. So besides me, who's your favorite director? different ones for different reasons. I'd say my, the Coens are my favorite directors to work with, but I should probably also explain that I don't like directors to tell me very much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you, in fact, I'll tell you something about that. A, a, a while ago, quite a while ago, I was in this Coen Brothers movie called A Serious Man. And uh, there I was at an award ceremony out here in California before I lived in California. Uh, it was the Independent Spirit Award, Independent Spirit Awards. This was 2009, I think. Anyway, so I was at this award ceremony and it was very exciting. You know, I won a big award. It was, you know, changed my whole life and everything. And at that award ceremony, I got to meet Robert Duvall. And I had never met him before. And he, I'm a big fan of his. I just think he's a fantastic actor, a huge fan. And uh, I happened to be sitting next to him in the way they did the seating at the, in the hall. So we started talking and he said, you know, I never worked with the Coen brothers, but I've always admired their work. I said, he said, what do they like to work with? I said, well, I was really surprised because they don't tell you very much. They write very, very highly specific scripts. And they like you to stick very much to what they said. They don't like you to do a lot of changing or improvising uh, with their language. They like you to stick pretty strictly to it. Uh, but in terms of performance, 
they don't give you much direction. They hire people that they, you know, sort of trust and they kind of let you run. He said, oh, they leave you alone. I said, yeah. He said, oh, great. That's exactly what I'm like. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I think that uh, sometimes a director, you know, you get lost or you're going in the wrong direction and the director has to, has to help you. Mm -hmm. So does anybody else have any anything that they'd like to say to Fred or ask Fred? Or I got Steve waving his hand over there. Steve, unmute yourself and say hello. Steve's an audio guy, so he knows how to mute unmute himself. Okay, can you hear me now? We yeah. can. Well, Hi, Steve. Pleasure to see you. How are you? I just wanted to say hello. It was good to see you. It's great and, to see you. Uh, I, I, I saw uh, Oren before. Yeah. Uh, I have a picture somewhere of Oren sitting on your lap, but oh. I won't post it because I don't want to get either of you in trouble. But uh, are you still hey, doing We always slept together twice. That was okay. it. That was, I, it. That was one of the. Uh, uh, are you still doing voiceover work or you don't do that anymore? I do a little bit. I do uh, here and there, but as you know, as you well know, um, the uh, landscape of the voiceover world has changed so vastly. Uh, Ninety-something percent of it now is non-union, um, uh, so I do very, very little. I only do stuff where uh, my quasi-celebrity means something, because otherwise I'm competing in too large a pool. It's not worth it for me. Yeah, I don't hear any of the uh, uh, quote old timers unquote anymore. Uh, I don't recognize any of the voices. Yeah, I, I don't either very often. I mean, I, I, and guys that I, guys who I thought were the absolute best uh, in the world, Harry Chase and uh, Norman Rose and uh, guys like that, Norman Rose is long gone, but uh, there's just no room for them, for them anymore. It's a, it's a totally different world. How, how do you think, well, in a world, uh, Fred, in the... <laughs> As it as it were, and, and that was probably like the last blast or the last gasp. That movie of of those days, I think. Could you talk about that movie because you really you sort of represented that whole voice of God generation in that movie in a way. Could you talk about the movie, how it happened? Sure. Um, that movie was a, a great pleasure for me to make. Um, I was living in New York as before I moved out to California. I was living out in Long Island in Montauk. And my agent called me and he said, do you know who uh, uh, Lake Bell is? I said, well, I'm familiar with the name, but I don't really, I can't really place her. He said, well, look her up. You've probably seen her and stuff. So I looked her up. He said, she left a script for you here with a note. So he said, when you come into the city, uh, pick up the script and read this letter that she left. So I did. I went to the city, got the script was very impressed with the caliber of the writing of the script. And she wrote me this lovely handwritten note saying, you know, I don't know if you know who I am. My name is Lake Bell. Uh, I wrote this script uh, a couple of years ago and I finally raised the money to do it uh, and thought of a lot of other guys for this part, none of whom uh, I think would be nearly as good as you. I don't know whether or not you're interested, but I would love to have you do it. So I read it and I thought it was terrific. And I called her and I said, listen, I would love to do it. I think it's wonderful. Let's, let's, uh, let's meet. So she was, she was in New York. So she said, okay, well, let's meet. We'll go down to a uh, uh, Soho house, which is kind of like a, it's kind of like the Shishi clubhouse for the, or was the Shishi clubhouse for the, for the people in the movie business. And there's one here in LA and there's one in New York. She said, I'll meet you there. She was so, you know, she wanted to impress me. She didn't know I was like, I was trying to impress her. <laughs> so uh, we go to Soho House and I'm talking with her there and I like the script. I tell her that I like the script. And at one point she said, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. So she went away to go to the bathroom. And when she went away, a guy walked up to me, a very short guy, very friendly. He said, uh, my name is Danny Strong. Uh, I'm an actor and a writer. I just want to tell you, I think you're great. I'm a huge fan of yours. I said, oh, that's so kind of you to say. I really appreciate it. Can I ask you a favor? He said, what? I said, you're an actor. He said, yes. 
I said, I'm here with a director trying to get a part. Will you walk away? And when she comes back from the toilet, will you go through this? <laughs> That's how shameless, what a shameless dick I am. Well, you worked in the promo world for years, Fred, right. so you know how to promote yourself, clearly. Right. So Danny Strong, who, by the way, subsequently has become one of the biggest writers in television. He writes a zillion big, famous things. Anyway, he said, sure, I will. So he walked away, Lake came back, and sure enough, five minutes later, he said, excuse me, my name is Danny Strong. I'm a big, he, you know, he played it out perfectly. I said, and I said, can't, don't bother me now. Can't you say I'm talking? No, I, didn't, I, didn't. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was said, thank you. I'm, you know, that's very kind of you. Anyway, so I wound up getting the part and doing it. And uh, I had no idea when we did that, that the voiceover world, uh, which I knew as this rather uh, small world, this coterie of maybe 150 guys and girls who did the vast majority of the work. I didn't know the ranks that were swelling already, people trying to get into it. You know, every three or four years, there would be an article in TV Guide, you know, the millionaires you never see on television who are the voiceovers that you know, but you don't know what they look like. And for a few days, people would be trying to get in and then it would quiet down. But for some reason, uh, somewhere around the turn of the century, uh, it was absolutely flooded with new people trying to get in and do it. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of a perfect storm where the technology became much less expensive and also ubiquitous. Every, everybody could have it. So people could compete from anywhere in the world because you can, you can do audio in real time uh, from anywhere virtually now. Uh, and um, that happened. And then there was also a strike that happened, a SAG strike. This was before SAG and after World One, World mm -hmm. One thing. A SAG strike happened, and this kind of opened the the floodgates for uh, a lot of new people to come in, and also for people that had always only used union labor to then switch. And now some huge companies, you know, Ford Motor Company and others, hire non-union voiceover talent, which has entirely changed the complexion of things. That's interesting. That's something that most people don't think of. Uh, does somebody else have a question for Fred? Since we're here, we have him. And we also have some people that I know, Fred, that you know, and that are old friends of yours. You probably see some names. Uh, please, Candy, raise, hand, please, raise, please raise your hand if you have a question and I'll call on you. Uh, we got Candy. Go ahead. So Lake didn't know that your forte was voiceover when she asked you to do this? She did not. She saw. She had seen me in the Coen Brothers film, A Serious Man, and I told her, you know, I spent many years uh, tilling the, those fields, but she did not know that. <laughs> um, she just thought it was uh, plausible that I could, you know, I had the right kind of sound and kind of looked, kind <laughs> of looked like a voiceover guy. <laughs> um, a, another thing about Lake that uh, Lake was this was her first feature that she ever directed. She directed a short before this, and she her poise and her ability to direct was just uh, remarkable to me. You know, really good directors don't say too much, but they have the capacity to know a certain thing to say that then somehow opens up the floodgates and you really get something from it. Um, Lake, with her very limited experience, somehow just had this kind of native ability and I was amazed at her poise and her ability to, to you know, have confidence in her actors and, and not freak out. And, you know, it's, directing is hard. You've got 9,000 things all at once you have to deal with. And it's, you know, actors in a sense have it easy because you have really only one thing to concentrate on. Uh, and when you, it's done, you go home and that's that. You don't have to worry about what's happening next week and next month and, you know, it, and, you know, if, it, if you're a director, particularly a writer director like Lake is, like the Coen brothers, are, you're talking about a minimum of three years on each project. And Lake was acting in it with you, wasn't she? She was acting it. And what she did was she had a friend of hers, a woman called Janixa Bravo, who has gone on to become quite a notable director. But she had a friend and she said, in the scenes that I'm in, that I'm acting in, do you mind just kind of keeping an eye on things? make sure that, you know, directorially things look okay. Mm -hmm. And her friend agreed to do that. Uh, and, 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 you know, it worked out very well. Um, that, and I, I enjoyed that part particularly because 
as an actor, you're always looking for the contradictions in characters. Um, you know, here's a guy who's obviously extremely selfish, uh, narcissistic, and also very threatened. I mean, threatened by his own daughter's success. And yet in his own screwy way, he does love his daughter. So that, you, you, as an actor, I'm always looking for what is heroic in people that are, that are not admirable and what the flaws are in the characters that are heroic. The, the kind of um, things that aren't consistent. That's what makes them human and interesting. I'm gonna take a moment of personal privilege here to introduce two people who are in the room. Uh, have, have, it, have most of you or any of you seen the two viral vignettes that Fred did? One was Jack's Inferno with Barry Bostwick and the other was Phoning It In with um, Jane Kesmarek. And we have two of the writers. We got Fred Strappel and Kurt Fried. So why don't you guys say hi so that your, your faces will pop up on the screen and everybody can sort of see you. Hi, all. How you doing? Hi, Fred. Hi. Hey, Fred. All right. This is uh, this is my daughter Madeline. She oh. wanted to. You know, well, she's an enormous fan of WandaVision, and so uh, this, this got me a lot of uh, credibility. Is not not quite such a, a nerdy father uh, that, that I got to speak to. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I got a little of the same credibility that you did. <laughs> Fred, I, I, just for those of us who happen to be Marvel fans, me, uh, <laughs> would you mind talking a little bit about WandaVision and how that was, and, and how that, you're in the Marvel universe now, how is that different from doing like a regular movie or TV show? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, it was an interesting experience. I, I had been in New York. Uh, I was making a film that came out uh, this past year um, called Shiva Baby which was made by a young woman who was just out of NYU, very young, 22 year old young girl. And that was another situation where I didn't know her. I didn't know anything about her, but I, I really liked the script. It was a very strong script. And it so happened that the woman who played my wife and it, Polly Draper and I uh, went to drama school together. I've known her for 45 years. So it was a chance to do something with somebody that's been my friend for you know a long time. So anyway, I did that movie uh, but that movie was, like many movies that I've done, was done really on a shoestring. I mean, when I say a shoestring, I mean, really. Their biggest line item, the biggest number one charge in that whole film was flying me business class from L.A. to New York. That's absolutely true. More than they spent on film stock, more than anything. Um, you know, the, the, the craft service table was a thing of like saltines, half a thing of saltines with a thing of peanut butter, plastic spoon in it. So I, but that's great. I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that there's a lot of uh, joy to be had in, in often in well-conceived, well-written things that don't have a lot of money. Anyway, while I was making that in New York, I got a call from my manager who said, uh, you know, I've been working on this Marvel thing for you. I said, yes. She said, well, it's, uh, it's all coming to fruition. And uh, they would like you to go, all the Marvel stuff is shot in, in uh, Atlanta. Uh, they, have, they kind of have their own studio. They have Pinewood, like Pinewood in England, but they, they control all the Pinewood studio. Uh, it's a very big operation. So she said, um, they want you to go right there directly to Atlanta. And uh, you, you're gonna have to be measured for your clothes and all this stuff. And I said, okay, great. And it was a great, it was a very interesting, you know, script I thought and a great, great opportunity. and. But I, I went directly from New York, where literally, uh, you know, they would have to turn the air conditioning off because the power bills were too expensive at a certain point. You know, it got really too expensive for them. Uh, to flying to Atlanta, where every day at uh, about eleven thirty, they would bring out lobster. <laughs> every day. Every day. Well, every weekday. Uh, and all the clothes were, were handmade in Italy. And the sets, the set uh, was bigger than any house I've ever lived in. And, you know, the, the degree of money, um, and, and don't get me wrong, it's all up there on the screen. It's not like they're wasting money. But it was, it was such a, an interesting uh, juxtaposition to go from this little, uh, you know, 
everything held together with gaffer's tape kind of production to the Marvel, which is the, you know, it's all, it's all about the, the largeness of it in every, in every respect. So that was a very interesting um, experience. And um, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not particularly a fan of uh, comic book movies, but I don't dislike them either. And um, everybody tries very hard. Uh, it's interesting, we were talking about this the other day um, in the last one of these that I participated in, in Linda Pearls. Um, you know, people are very often very jaundiced about Hollywood and uh, they kind of think Hollywood is synonymous with corruption and, uh, you know, misleading people and that kind of thing. And in my experience, um, the vast majority of people that work in Hollywood actually care very deeply about the quality of the work that they produce. Uh, they really want it to be good. Um, I don't just mean to make a profit, but I mean, they actually are concerned that it be as good as it can be. And the actors who are tasked with making these characters that are, you know, essentially uh, comic book characters, more interesting, more human, more, more textured, you know, take that very seriously. And so do the directors and the writers. So Marvel, I think to a significant degree has been successful at that without disappointing, uh, you know, the 17 year old or 16 year old fan base of people that want to see lots of action, lots of fighting, lots of all that stuff. The, the, 60, some, the 60 something fan base, Fred. Yes. Exactly. The sixty-something fan base. Exactly. Um, we have some. We have some old friends of yours that I'm going to let say hello before. But first, uh, I think Ashley, do you have a question? Yes, I just had a really quick follow-up question for your one division. That's what I was going to ask about is one division. Um, Dick, the Dick Van Dyke Show is one of my very favorite shows. I was kind of like Wanda. I grew up watching it and loving Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore. So that's part of why I really liked that segment in your episode and i'm not going to take this answer as gospel but do you feel like there are any other dick van dykes out there and mary tyler morris like if they redid this episode and this series who would you cast and who would you say yeah they could fill those shoes or do you think there isn't anybody like them gosh that's a good hard question to answer <laughs> I, i'm sure there are people like that mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking specifically, I mean, the, the, what was so great, see, it's interesting. As time went on, in my, this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. um, television in general became more formulaic as time went mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, when you, the, the thing about Dick Van Dyke is, when I, we had to study it, by the way, to do that. Yes. Episode. We just yeah. watched hours of it to, to really think about it. Even though it's played for laughs, and it's played with a kind of a light touch. It's very realistic. Mm -hmm. And you actually, I mean, if you look at it with a critical eye, they try hard to make the characters as real as they can. Right. Um, you know, that, that's, that's uh, instead of just making them a trope about something or other. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I certainly think there are actors who can fulfill that but it's, it has to be a confluence of the writing and the actor and the production in general. Yeah. Uh, to make that really, uh, you know, sing. Yeah. So I'm, sure, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it could be done. I think the quality of television nowadays, especially with the massive amount of television that's being produced, mm -hmm. um, is quite impressive. I mean, not all of it, but quite a bit of it is. Um, dramedy has become much more uh, of, a, of a kind of a real thing than it ever was back in those days. Um, things that are both funny and also kind of uh, dramatically engaging and sometimes sad and sometimes serious. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly think there are people that could handle it. I can't tell you off the top of my head who I think has that light touch yeah. uh, that you need. Yeah. But, but I... <laughs> I'll certainly, I certainly will think about it. Um, I, I couldn't think of anyone, so I thought I would, I would like, I would be interested in your opinion. I just feel like they were a perfect storm of talent and writing and production and chemistry, and it was just a perfect 
sitcom almost feels like the wrong word. It was just a perfect show to me. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think there are other shows of that era that have mm-hmm. a similar quality. Andy Griffith has a similar quality. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously completely different kind of show. But the, 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 the point is when you see a show like, and this is my, I, I, okay, this is my sort of theory of drama in general or of movies and television in general. The characters are always the thing that brings you back. Mm-hmm. The plot is essentially a device on which to hang the characters. That's the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't mean that plotting is easy. It's not easy. Right. But the thing that sticks in your mind, I mean, when I think of The Godfather, for example, which is a great film, or I think of Boogie Nights, which is my idea of a great film, or many other great films, Tre- uh, Treasure of Sierra Madre. Um, the plot points are, I would be hard pressed to actually be accurate and tell you what the whole plot is. Right. But I remember the characters and what they do vividly. Right. So, you know, when you go see the Andy Griffith show, so why do people not like Andy Griffith? Well, the warmth of that character in that situation. And, uh, you know, Bill Bixby in that same era, uh, similar quality to, to me anyway. You, you, you miss the, it's the personality of those characters yeah. that makes you want to tune in all the time. Right. You couldn't actually say what your favorite episode is. You just, it's, you would watch them read the phone book. You would watch them be those characters because that's what you're tuning in for is them. Although the plot does help, but it's mostly, you want to see them. You want to see Andy and Barney and you want to, it doesn't matter what they do. You just want to see them do something. Right. Likewise, Star Trek people, you know, there are particular episodes that show things off more dramatically or kind of uh, m- more demonstrably, but it's still the characters and what they do mm-hmm. that's the thing that's the real draw, I think. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's interesting, Fred, you kind of reminded me, um, and I'll get to you, Jonathan, you'll be next. Uh, you kind of reminded me in that a little bit of the vibe of like some of the character actors from back then, especially like a Richard Deacon, obviously from the from the Dick Van Dyke show where those, those blustery bosses, uh, you know where you where you you had the physical presence, but you also had a way of delivering your lines, and and it just recalled the just the acting style just recalled that era as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think it was. I think my resemblance to Richard Deacon was was well noted by the people who cast me. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, we were trying to we were we were trying to keep it sort of flying as they did, but also kind of keep it, you know, as real as we could within the confines of doing something that was obviously very far outside the realm of reality. Um, you know, also that doing something like that, you, you try not, you try and isolate yourself from the pressure of it being, you know, it was Marvel's uh, kind of introduction mm-hmm. on Disney Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a big money project on which a lot was riding. So you, you try and kind of divorce yourself from that, uh, those expectations mentally, but you can't completely, you know, you, you, you feel it. Um, but yeah, I, I think we were trying to, to, to stylistically pay homage to those people, but also, to also trying to do it, keep it, keeping it, you know, kind of real as real as as real as we could under the under those circumstances yeah you truly captured something there that, that i think you 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 wanted to capture jonathan i promised that you would be next yeah. <clears throat> hi fred how you doing good how are you nice to meet you nice to meet you fred. um i was just wondering because you obviously you know did a lot of work in the in voiceovers and and obviously with the acting do you approach the voice work differently than you do the acting work I try to approach it the same way. I don't always succeed, but I try to approach it the same way. I try to approach it all as acting. Meaning to me, I try to approach it all subtextually. Even though there's a text, there are words and the words may be as mercenary as, you know, see the USA and your Chevrolet. Um, I guess that's, that's nothing like that now, but there's plenty of things that are equally shallow. I still try and, and have, a secret message beneath the words. 
that I'm trying to impart. I'll give you an example. There was a commercial on years ago, and it sticks in my head for Dove bars. Remember Dove bars? Those, yeah. Those, those chocolate covered. I was bars. thinking. I was going to say the soap Dove bars or the chocolate Dove bars. Oh, the but, chocolate, but, but the soap. That's, believe me, the soap Dove bars don't do anything for me. But the chocolate ice cream. <laughs> So there was a, maybe 10 or maybe more than that, maybe 15 years ago, I remember this commercial for Dove Bars that came on. And it was a very simple commercial, technically. All it was was a shot of a piece of vanilla ice cream with a stick through it, with this very rich looking chocolate being uh, you know, poured over it, melted chocolate. And Kathleen Turner was the voice on the voiceover, the very husky, sexy voice of Kathleen Turner. And I can't remember what the nature of the copy was that she was saying. It was something very simple. But the, but the subtext was, the feeling that you got was, whatever is going on in your life, however difficult or troubled or good your life is, whatever else is going on, for the five minutes that it takes, or two minutes in my case, that it takes you to eat this Dove bar, nothing else will bother you. Nothing else will matter like the old Calgon take me away. So a few of you probably old enough to remember Calgon take me away, but I am old. Um, it, 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 the promise is that whatever else is going on in your life, this enjoying this particular thing will transport you to another world. And that's not said anywhere in the words, but it's in the, in the reading. So I'm always trying to impart something like that in the reading. And the message can be anything. It can be anything. It can have nothing to do with the product, but I still approach it the same way. Uh, and that's also the way that I approach acting. I try and approach it uh, subtextually, but honestly, like putting myself in that situation. We had an interesting conversation about this with, with Linda. The way I think of acting is this. People say, well, is the character somebody else or is it you? How do you approach a character? The way I think of it is that the character is always me, but it's me wearing a coat and the coat can be extremely different from me. In other words, an entirely different way of relating to women, relating to money, relating to the physical world the character could be very physically different from me. He could be a person who is disabled, be a person who's weak, a person who's sick, a person who's much stronger than me, um, a person who is suspicious by nature, uh, a person who starts out hating people, a person who doesn't want to deal with people like Woody Allen. <laughs> um, it could be extremely different from me, but it's still me underneath because it's my responsibility as an actor to be real within the circumstance that I'm facing and to be with it in the moment as much as I can. So you have a kind of a dual responsibility. I'm sitting there in my hotel room or in my house reading a script and thinking, okay, how do I wanna play this? How, what am I gonna do with this? So I bring that in when we actually do it. But at the same time, I have to also respond honestly or try to respond honestly to whatever I'm getting, whatever the other actor is giving me or the, the room, the set, uh, the, the, the words, the director, I have to respond to all that stuff simultaneously with whatever it is that I've prepared. And if, whatever, if what I've prepared doesn't, doesn't fit right, I have to, I have to be prepared to, to um, adjust it, to alter it. So it's both things at once. That's why it's always interesting. It's because it's, it's about people and people are unbelievable in their ability to tell themselves anything you know I, I find this so interesting about people as i was saying like i don't i think even the worst people i think i think donald trump didn't get up and say how am i going to mess up the world today <laughs> i think people who are e even the most selfish people think well if people would just listen to me the world would be better if people would just do what i think then everything would be great you know if, if, if the world would swing if i were king so i I'm fascinated with how people deal with life. You know, how does, I've never killed anybody and God willing, I never will. But I've known what it's like to be enraged. I've known what it's like to wanna kill somebody. 
or at least want to smack them. One, <laughs> I, I know what it's like to, to be accused of something that I didn't do. I know what it's like to be guilty about things that I, I, I didn't do a very good job with something and I feel bad about. It. So all these things, you know, it's unlikely in my life that I'd ever get to be a real hero in a military situation. Um, it's unlikely that I'd ever be punished for doing, I hope it's unlikely that I'd ever be punished for doing something horrible. But it's fascinating to be able to act that out and see what it's like emotionally, see what mm -hmm. it feels like. It's one of the great joys of acting. That and having your afternoons free where you can go to discount movies, that's the other good thing. Well, those are, that's, a, that's the best part. Um, I'm gonna take a moment here because we've just got a few more minutes left. So I see Rachel has her hand up. Hi, Fred. Hi, Rachel. Uh I was curious to know a little bit more about WandaVision and you walking into that project and without spoiling it for anybody who hasn't seen it, it's, it's a show that you kind of unpeel as you go along. And um, I was curious how much you knew going into episode one about where they were headed and, and how that might have impacted the, the journey you were on in, in the work you did in, in, in that first episode and, and knowing what was ahead or not knowing what was ahead? What a good question that is. Um, the answer is not too much. I knew, it, it may be, it's possible that, uh, that the leads knew much more than I did. I don't know. I knew that my character was essentially acting a role that wasn't his real self, but he was forced, I don't want to ruin this for anybody that maybe hasn't seen it. He was forced by the kind of spell that he was under to, to enact this role. And yet he was conscious of the fact that it was an act. I knew that. And I knew that he had his own life separate from this character, this character that he was pretending to be about which he was concerned. And in the original, in the original scripts, my part was actually much bigger. Uh, he came back in later and tried to kind of escape from this. But I guess it became an issue of uh, too many sort of plots going on simultaneously. And, that, and unfortunately, uh, I never got to do that, which was kind of the, my best scene in the whole thing. But um, so I knew that, uh, that there was this big rift. And you see that in the very first episode when I, in the scene where I choke on the, on the um, on the strawberry and Paul Bettany's character uh, saves me from it. You see cracks beginning to develop, to develop. Mm -hmm. But where ultimately those cracks would go, um, I didn't know. And I didn't know um, that, um, I didn't know how important the next door neighbor would wind up being. Um, I, I, I mean, I knew that she was important. I knew she was there for a reason, but I didn't know quite how important that was. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think she knew, but I don't think anybody else knew. I think they intentionally did not tell us too many things about how things would wind up um, because they wanted us to not tip any of it. And, and have you watched it all since? Oh, yes. yes what was it like watching it once? Uh, what was it like once watching it once it was all done and it was like a year later or so later, right? Well, I mean... I mean, I had a number of reactions to it. Anytime I see anything that I do, I always think, oh, Jesus, why did I do that? I, 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 can't, I could have made that so much better. I mean, that's the first thing I think usually. Um, uh, and to be frank with you, uh, then I think, Jesus, I was so fat then. <laughs> and then I think, um, you know, once I get over that self-conscious stuff, then I think, well, this is so interesting that I got to be a part of this thing. And, and look how... I knew what some of the writers were doing because we talked about it, but I didn't know how they were going to, in how, in what direction they were going to ultimately take it, and how they, and how beautifully they were able to kind of make it make sense in its in its kind of crazy way. And I was proud that I was part of this massive effort. You know, it's like being in the army; you're just one little cog in this huge thing. But I was very proud with about how it came out ultimately. 
and uh, uh, and the writer and director of that uh, of that it was one director for all those episodes. It's very unusual in TV. Um, uh, were very kind to me, and you know it was. Uh, I, I really enjoyed being a part of it, limited as my as my part was, only the two episodes. But originally, I was supposed to be in five of the episodes. Uh, I think Seth has a question for you, Fred. Hey, Seth. So, so Fred, can I say I knew you went? Absolutely. Because when you, when you talk about your um, putting your all into your voiceover work, you mm -hmm. were the voice of USA World Premiere Movies for uh, forever. And I'll never forget, as a uh, young producer, probably recording with Steve, we as uh, promo producers would uh, would have 30 seconds to tell our story. And of course, we'd probably write about 27 seconds worth of copy and leave about three seconds worth of tags. And I remember directing Fred in the booth, and we'd get up to the tags, and Fred and his big voice would go like, Tuesday at 9, 8 Central. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Fred. Fred. <laughs> So, so that's my little promo story. Um, let me ask you, with, with all your roles, going all the way back to, uh, what was it, Suspect with Cher? Is that your first one? No, first one with, was, was, with, with the, was in a movie called um, Love Sick with Dudley Moore and Elizabeth McGovern. So I remember that. With which, which actor or actress, um, A, did you learn the most from, and B, did you find most challenging uh, slash rewarding to, uh, to work with? That's a good question. Um, well, there are a number that I've loved working with uh, for different reasons. Um, who, who I learned the most from? I learned the most from an English actor uh, who said to me, "I was it was it, it, it was in a product it was in Amadeus on Broadway, and I had a scene in Amadeus." Where I, th where I was, it was meant to be funny. And it was funny and I'd always get a laugh from the audience. You know, the audience always liked it. And as time went on, uh, I made more and more, <laughs> I made more and more of it and milked it. And it got to be, you know, too much. And he said to me a very useful thing. He said, you know, we're all human. And everybody likes when the audience likes them. That's you know that's part of why we're actors. He said, but when you're when you relax and you really think you're funny at something, it's easier for things to get bigger and bigger. What he said was, when you relax into a part and you feel you know what you're doing, instead of going bigger, try to always go deeper. Deeper. So deeper, not bigger, has become my kind of motto. I try and go deeper, not bigger. So I, I, that was a great uh, lesson. He also was a very good actor. Um, challenging, different ones for different reasons. Uh, Deb <laughs> in, in WandaVision, my wife was played by an actor, a friend of mine, a woman called Deborah Jo Rupp. Many of you probably know from that 70s show, she played the mom on that, that, uh, that TV show for, I don't know, gosh, 10 years or a long, long time from then. Who I've known for a long time and uh, is a very skilled actor, very talented actor, but is the kind of actor where uh, she thinks constantly about what she's doing so it was challenging to do, do certain scenes with her because uh, she was so intent on what she was doing that it was kind of like, it, and this is not this is not uncommon among actors, but kind of nobody else kind of got through that that sort of uh, candy shell. Uh, but I, you know, I'm the kind of person who. Um, I like to enjoy life if possible, and I like to enjoy my work. And one of the really beautiful things about acting is um, you're thrown together with people and to use the military uh, uh, simile again, it's like being in the army. You, 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 you're, you, the nature of the work is emotional and you're with each other for long, you know, 14 hours a day sometimes. So you get to be close, you know? 
And sometimes the closeness lasts and you, you remain close and sometimes you don't see each other for years, you know, it's situational. But I'm a kind of a, um, I don't want to say loner, but I, I think I tend to be an isolated kind of person. So I like the collaborative nature of what we do because it throws you together with people. And I like that. And I like, I like having that human interaction that's just part of the job. Um, you know, and, and it makes you think about life. You're, you're, after all, you're, you're studying people, you're studying mankind. And to me, that's really interesting. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question very well. But. That's, that's a great place to leave. Thank you all for coming. I love these things. Fred, you make it like a, like a, like a master class, and I, it's, it's really uh, terrific. Come by for any of the future ones because it's, it's fun having you. So thank you. Give him a hand. Thank you. A muted hand.